Thank you everyone for coming out this morning. I know third day of the conference, that 1030 talk is feeling quite a bit earlier than maybe a 1030 talk did on the first day of the conference, so I'm glad you're here. My name is Dave Rolski, and I am going to talk about why do programmers love Rust. I've been software developer for 24-ish years now. Uh, for a long time, I did a lot of Perl. These days, in my day job, I actually do Go. Uh, but then for <clears throat> most of my hobby projects, I do Rust. Uh, I'm actually te teaching a Go class tomorrow, but Rust is more fun, and I guess I'm one of the people who love it. Uh, I haven't taken, I don't know if I've taken the Stack Overflow survey recently, but yeah. So uh, this is a QR code, which will take you to the slides, or you can follow that link, bit.ly slash love dash Russ. I encourage you to follow along on your own device. There's a, a number of slides with code examples and error messages, where especially if you're sitting towards the back, it may be a little tough to read on here. I did try to do my best to make it as readable as possible, but you can also just follow along on your phone or your laptop or something like that. So, and there's also, uh, this is the link to the repo, bit.ly slash that dash repo. This has all the code examples. Uh, it's my presentation's repo, so scroll down to why do programmers love Rust and then go to the examples directory. All right, so one thing I wanna emphasize, this is not a Rust tutorial. You're not gonna come away from this knowing how to program Rust. I probably couldn't teach you that. In 50 minutes, I'm not even sure I could teach you that in one day. One of the maybe downsides of Rust is it's a little more complex in some ways than other languages. That said, I'm gonna show you a bunch of things kind of about Rust that I think are really cool that other people have cited as things they enjoy about Rust, and maybe this will inspire you to go learn Rust on your own. That said, if you have questions about something, piece of code or whatever, do feel free to ask, just raise your hand. So this is from the 2021 Stack Overflow survey. I was too lazy to update this for more recent, recent surveys, but they all look like this. Uh, the, the question is, you know, most loved language and consistently Rust has been at the top. Uh, sadly, like I mentioned, you know, before the, we, when we were chatting before I started the talk, Perl has not done as well on this metric. I still love Perl, but yeah, it's not, it's not coming up as high as Rust. Uh, Rust was also the most lang loved language in 2016 through 2020 and 2022. And again, I was kind of lazy. I didn't look at the 2023 survey, but I'm about 99% sure. Yeah, Daniel's giving me a thumbs up. It was the most loved language in 2023 as well. So people really love Rust and they've loved it for a long time. This is a love that burns. It's a love for the ages. It's not just a f flash in the pan, just a high school crush. This is soulmate stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is this is real real love, true love. So I'm just curious about people's context. I'm guessing most of you have a Perl background or anybody not do Perl at all? Well, okay, Racco, of course, sorry. Yes, a Perl and Racco background. I should, really should have added that to the list. I will for if I do this again. Uh, any C, C++ programmers out there? Okay, so you'll really appreciate some facts, things about Rust. Any Go programmers? I guess me. <laughs> All right, so let's first just talk about what is Rust. Obviously it's a programming language, but a little more detail. So it's often referred to as a systems language, but I've seen it used for all sorts of stuff. I've used it for various things myself. Uh, it just certainly gets used for kind of systems cases, writing low level things, writing daemons. You can now, uh, there is Rust support in the Linux kernel, so you can write, uh, I believe, uh, Linux modules in Rust. Uh, I'm not sure what the state of that is, but I think some of the initial work has been merged. Uh, people do embedded programming in Rust, but you know, people also do things like write CLI tools, which I've written several of in Rust. Uh, games, web services, you can even do front end dev in Rust and compile it down to WebAssembly, and I've done a little of that myself. And it's pretty interesting. It is a compiled language that statically links, so the resulting binary does not link to anything except libc, except when you statically li link musl, which you can do on platforms where that's supported. The compiler itself just builds on top of LV LLVM, so there, you know, a fair bit of the work is done through that. It's a type check language, type checked at compile time with a pretty powerful type system. We'll look at some examples of what this can do for you. 
One really interesting fact about it is it has no garbage collection, but it also doesn't have any manual memory management uh, either. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, most things go on the stack by default, but you can opt to put things on the heap if you prefer. You can even replace the global allocator, and I believe people you know, sometimes do that in like an embedded context. You can also write code that doesn't uh, allocate memory at runtime at all uh, if you want, I believe. I'm saying that with such confidence, and then I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that's true. So uh, my experience with Rust, like I mentioned, I've done some CLI tools. I wrote a gRPC backend. These are also for kind of personal projects. Wrote a web front end. Uh, the, the CLI tools, are, there's one called Precious, one called UBI. Precious is kind of a, uh, a sequel to Tidyall, which some of you may have used. It's a Perl module and Perl command line tool. Uh, there were kind of some fundamental design issues with it that I couldn't really fix without just rewriting Tidyall and kind of breaking it. And since a lot of people already used it, especially in the Perl community, that just seemed like a really bad idea. So I just decided to write a new tool that works quite differently. And UBI uh, stands for Universal wait, Binary Installer. I'm like, what does it stand for? I wrote it. Uh, it's a tool to download binary releases from GitHub, because there's a lot of Go and Rust projects that will just release binaries onto the GitHub releases page. It's kind of annoying to have to install them by hand. I also started working on this music player, and that's where the gRPC backend and web front end came from. I haven't finished that because this was well, during a period I was intentionally unemployed, and so I had a lot of free time, and now I have a job, and I just don't have as much free time. Yes, Bruce. What's gRPC? Uh, Bruce asks, what's gRPC? Great question, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Google, R is that what it stands for Google RPC? It's a protocol for uh, communicating between two services. Uh, it uses protobuf as the transmission layer and there's like a gRPC description file format where you describe kind of the uh, remote procedure calls you support and so on. It's, it's an alternative to a REST API or GraphQL. So why is Rust consistently being uh, coming up as the most loved language? Uh, I, there's this Reddit thread I link on why Rust is so loved. And somebody asked exactly that <clears throat> question in the Rust subreddit. And I'm going to go through a lot of what they mentioned and add a few of my own. But everything that people mentioned in this thread were just things I, I agreed with. So Rust's core proposition is memory safety and performance. Remember I said you don't do ma manual memory allocation, but it also doesn't have a garbage collector. It also uh, is aiming for fearless concurrency, meaning it prevents many, not all, of the typical concurrency problems. Most notably, it prevents any sort of uh, unsafe sharing of data between threads. You cannot, the compiler will not let you do many of the things that you do by accident in other languages. It can't prevent everything. Notably, you can still have deadlocks between threads. That's a harder problem to solve. Uh, and it, another part of the core proposition is data ownership or, but as part of the type system. We'll get into that a little more. So some of the language features include, I mentioned a pretty strong type system. It has enums, we'll go into that, traits, has generics, but there's no new va nil values, and I put that under generics because generics are what enable not having nil values. It has really cool pattern matching we'll look at. <clears throat> Iterators are built in. Things are immutable di by default, so your variable, unless you declare it as mutable, is immutable. I, I really like that. Uh, it also has a pretty powerful macro system. We'll see some examples of it. We won't go into how they're written. That's, a, that's some pretty deep magic. Uh, one thing I'll say about the type system is even though it's really powerful, it doesn't have the challenges uh, of pure functional programming. So you'll never see the words, mon well, no, not never. You're unlikely to see the words monad, monoid, category, or arrow when reading Rust documentation, which I am very thankful for because every time I see that, I'm just like, what is this gibberish? What does it mean? I don't understand. I've tried to learn Haskell a couple times and really struggled. It also has really great tooling. There's a tool called Rustop, which is kind of like Pearl Brew. Amazing compiler errors. We'll see some of those. This tool called Cargo, it, which is also uh, inter both runs the compiler, but also gets all your dependencies. Uh, there's Rust Analyzer, which is an LSP server, a tool to format your Rust code. 
and Clippy, which is a thing that ships with Rust Core that is the linter. Uh, there's a lot of goofy, funny names in, the, in Rust stuff. It also has a, <clears throat> a really great ecosystem and community. The core of Rust has really good documentation. Library documentation varies as you would expect. It, many of them are pretty good and, and the most popularly used libraries have excellent documentation. Unsurprisingly, newer stuff or stuff with fewer users, the documentation's more hit or miss, but it's the same way with any language. It also has a really good ecosystem of existing libraries. There's this thing called, I always call it CERD, but it stands for serialization deserialization, so maybe it's CERD, I don't know. What? CERD. CERD. Well, that, that just makes no sense. Um, <laughs> uh, that's absurd. Uh, anyway, it's a really great generic framework for building uh, serialization and deserialization for various formats where you can have kind of the same user-facing API for different formats while under the hood they're implemented differently. It's pretty cool. Rayon is this incredibly powerful library for building parallel code where you can spin up multiple threads in just the easiest way. It's really nice. It also has a really good community. My experience has been that it, it, the type, I don't know if any of you were at Sawyer's talk about abuse, I have seen much less of this behavior in the Rust community. The Rust community is intolerant of abusive behavior, which I really like. And it's also just got like a pretty positive atmosphere. Of course, nothing's perfect. There have been issues in the Rust community. There was one within the past couple months, but it's been pretty good. And one of my personal favorites about it is there's very little of the philosophy of good enough for me, but not for thee. This is one of my biggest complaints about Go. A lot of Go is implemented in a way where like as a mere user, I cannot do the same thing. Whereas in Rust, that's really not the case. Almost every feature in the language is implemented in an open way where you, know, you can make your own iterators, you can make your own numeric types, and they can work more or less like the ones that are built into the language. For example, you can implement overloading for most operators. Most everything, types, traits, macros, they're implemented in Rust. There are a few things that aren't, uh, which are, it can be a little annoying, most notably for me, trying to figure out how things like uh, print line or, or other macros that interpolate string, uh, variables into strings, that is kind of implemented at the compiler level in a kind of hidden way, which is annoying. Other than that, I haven't had too many challenges where I was like, oh man, I really wish I could take advantage of this. And the day that my day-to-day -day language Go is completely the opposite, where like you just can't do anything that the compiler can do. You can't implement your own numeric types. You cannot implement your own maps or arrays or anything like that. And that can be kind of annoying. So it's really nice. So let's take a look at memory safety. So one of the things you cannot do in Rust is return pointers to the stack because that would be bad, because then things blow up and horrible uh, errors happen. So here's an example, we're gonna call returns pointer. It allocates a variable inside the function that is allocated on the stack and tries to return a pointer to it. And what does the compiler say? And again, this is why I suggest maybe following along on your own device or just you know move to the front couple rows, there's plenty of seats, it might be hard to read this. So what it says is the compiler is saying, returns a reference to data owned by the current function. And it's just saying, you can't do this, and it's really nice. It's a, there's, you can see the, the error is kind of highlighted. It shows you exactly <clears throat> where you are doing this, what the variable is. Uh, you can get more information about it. It's really cool. It also has other forms of memory safety. There's no double free. That's because there's no single free. You don't have to free memory. It does it for you. There's, you can't really make pointers to freed memory. I should qualify this. There's this thing called unsafe in Rust where you can just go ham and just completely violate all these things. Uh, the idea when you write unsafe code is you're going to manually uphold these invariants. Most of the time you don't need to write unsafe code. It's I'd say most common for extreme performance scenarios or when dealing with external systems, when interfacing with C and C++ code. If you're just writing pure Rust, you pro most of the time do not have to write unsafe code. Uh, one, so I mentioned, you know, no double free, no points to free memory. Rust deallocates memory when a thing goes out of scope, which is really similar 
to Perl's destroy, and you can actually fire off code that happens at this point be it with a trait called drop. Again, just like destroy, which is actually really handy and all sorts of cool things you can do with it. You cannot read and write to the same thing at once. So in this case, we've made a mutable vec, which is just a slice or an array. And we're gonna try to iterate over it, looking at the members of the vec and then push into the vec. So we're reading from it, then we're trying to write from it. And the compiler is very unhappy about this. It says, hey, well, there's an immutable bar here. That's when we were reading from it. And then we're gonna try to mutably borrow when we write to it, and it just won't let me do that. Uh, and again, there's a lot of details here, and I really appreciate like the color coding and just all the information it gives me. It's very nice. Any questions so far? Are we good? Unless you're about to say that, what is the correct version of that? Uh, uh, just video. What is the correct version? You know, actually, I'm not sure off the top of my head. One thing you could do, actually, in this case, I think because it's a VEC of numbers, you can take away the, that's a good question, I'll have to look this up. <laughs> Somebody knows. I think you just make it a mutable borrow here where you're iterating. Oh, uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense, that would work. Um, well, it's mutable, it should be. Yeah, yeah. Question. I was gonna say that as I was trying to learn Rust, um, I, I appreciate these messages, but you get a lot of these messages as you're learning it, and it's not a very forgiving language. Mm. Perl and Python are very easy to learn, and it's very frustrating to get messages like that over and over again and not know what you're doing wrong. Like yeah, so, trying to help you. so I, this is, I think, a really good point. Walt was saying that when he was trying to learn Rust, what his experience was is you get a lot of these helpful error messages. And it can really feel overwhelming where you just keep getting more like errors, you fix something, you get a new error. Uh, and even though the compiler is trying to be helpful, it can still be really hard to understand, I think kind of at a, a, maybe a global level, like what does correct Rust code look like? I, I totally agree. I had the exact same experience when I was first trying to write Rust. I'm just like, okay, yes, I get it that this isn't allowed, but like how can I prevent myself from getting so many errors? And I. I think this is maybe the, 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 the big downside of Rust, which is that it's got a steeper barrier to entry. I think it'll, it takes a little longer to get comfortable and productive with the language than many other languages. Uh, Walt mentioned Python and Perl, were those the two? Uh, you know, and those are a lot easier. They're like, it's really hard to, barring syntax errors, it's really hard to get Perl to otherwise complain about what you're doing because it just makes everything work. Yeah, that is absolutely the downside of Rust. The, the, I will say though that it's not that hard to start to understand this stuff. And once you do, you just write code that doesn't have all these problems more instinctively. Or when you get the errors, it's more obvious how to fix it globally. Uh, what part of the problem is you can fix one error and then that just kind of moves the error to a different point, like in your call stack or something, uh, unless you really understand the error more deeply and then you can fix it all at once across the entire program. Uh, yeah. So the kids will say I have I've taken in a password. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So the, the question was, let's say I have some sort of uh, data, the password was your example, where when you're done using it and it goes out of scope, you wanna make sure it's deleted from memory. I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there is either a crate, as in a library that'll do this, or you could do it yourself using unsafe code in the drop trait, where you could directly access the memory that that occupied and write you know zeros to it. Is there a crate for this? Yeah, okay, you're nodding your head. Yeah, there's a crate called ZeroWise. Okay. Uh, and basically you just, you make construct, you can just say derive ZeroWise, and it will automatically like drop it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's probably, and I'm sure it's using unsafe code under the hood to do this. I think so. Oh, really? It does do things around the, looking at write boundaries and making sure that it's concurrently being cleared. And, uh, there's some complexity of some of the 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, the, there's a crate called zeroize that you basically annotate data structures using, and it will take care of this zeroizing memory for you when they go out of scope. And uh, it's saying it's implemented not with unsafe for us, but some sort of other magic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's so using the drop trait, and the, it goes to some lengths to make sure that this is, this code is never optimized away, because that would completely defeat the purpose of using this. So, yeah, good question. <clears throat> so another thing that Rust provides, I mentioned fearless concern, currency, that it does not allow data races. So in this example, I have a mutable hash map. I have, and then I'm going to spawn a bunch of threads, and inside that thread. I'm gonna to try to mutate the hash map by getting an entry for a specific key. If it doesn't exist, I'm gonna insert the value one, otherwise I'm gonna increment it. Uh, and then there's some kind of code emitted about handling the threads, so it's irrelevant. The important part is the compiler really doesn't like this. It says V was mutably borrowed here in the previous iteration of the loop, and then it's not gonna let me use it multiple times. You can't mutably borrow something more than once. And there's a bunch of other things it's telling me. The point is, the compiler doesn't let me do this thing that is very dangerous. So the right way to do this, it's a little more complicated. You have to use a mutex, and then you use this thing called an ARC, which stands for Atomically Reference Counted, uh, Reference Counter. It's a wrapper that you can wrap any data type with. <clears throat> it allows for a thread safe ownership of the value that it wraps. In this case, it's wrapping a mutex, which wraps a hash map. map. And one thing I really want to highlight is inside thread spawn, that first line where it says, let mute blah equals v dot lock. <clears throat> the only way to get to the underlying hash map is through the mutex. The mutex is not a separate thing from the hash map. I don't have two variables in the scope. Uh, I just have the mutex. Well, really, I have the arc, but we can ignore that. I have the mutex, and I have to get the lock before I can get at the hash map that the mutex protects. And then when the thing I've gotten, the hash map goes out of scope and is dropped, the lock is released. So it's literally impossible to kind of misuse the mutex here, you, the, or to get at the variable without the mutex. So it's just a really nice design. Most other languages with ha which have mutexes, the, you know, you make a struct that has the mutex and the thing you want to protect in the same struct, but nothing actually stops you from not using the mutex other than you try to be careful. With Rust, you just can't do it. I really enjoy this aspect of the system. <clears throat> of course, you could write a, your own mutex type that wasn't like this, but this is built into the language, so just use this. I mentioned the type system has enums. These are kind of, uh, here's a very trivial one. It's just three possible values for size. That this drive bit is a macro. It implements some built-in traits, so debug lets you pretty print it in uh, output to the console or elsewhere. Partial equals thing I won't get into. Uh, you can also see the pattern matching, so we match on size and we check all the different sizes. But what if we didn't match every variant? So let's say I comment out matching size large. Well, Rust doesn't like that. It says pattern large not covered, and in fact, it even gives me a suggestion of how to cover it. It's not 100% correct, but close enough. Uh, it says you're missing large and you should do something. Now, if I just had to do, then I think to do, like, well, panic if we actually hit that branch or print out some sort of message, whatever. Uh, the point is, I can't do this, this thing where I just don't match all the sizes. I have to handle all the cases. And this will come up in a number of ways. It's really, really powerful. The type says uh, the enums can also carry data. So in this case, we have an error enum. We have a file error, which has a string inside. That string might be the file name. Uh, size exceeded, maybe that's the size that was too big. And bad name, which contains a name struct that is the name we thought was bad. This is really cool and powerful. Any questions so far before I jump on? How are those enums encoded? How are the enums encoded? Uh, I don't, I, Right, so you're thinking of C enum. So that he's saying C enums are typically an integer. This is a totally different type of enum. It's a, it's a, it's called a sum type. I want to say 
Yes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's not the same as a C enum. It's not just like a, a constant a set or a set of constants. It's a data structure that has different variations. And you know that, for example, given an error, it's got to be one of these three things. You can check for all of these three things. Uh, there is, however, a way you can tell Rust that you want to make a C style enum, which can be useful for interfacing with C or C++ code. Or if you're, you can also compile Rust down to a dynamic library that can be loaded uh, by C code, by Perl, Python, Raku code. And in that case, that, that style of enum might be useful. So we'll talk about traits. They're like roles in Moose, Moo, or Raku, interfaces in other languages. There's a whole bunch of built-in traits that implement basic features like comparison, equality, debugging output. We saw that derive earlier of debug and partial equal. You can write your own traits. And you can also, and this is super cool, you can implement your own traits on foreign types, including types built into the language. But the trait that you added is only in scope when you import that trait into your namespace. So you can add a trait, say, to the unsigned 8-bit integer type, but do it by simply loading that library, using that library, does not infect all code that uses unsigned 8-bit integers. You have to import that trait by name, and then it's in scope, which is really cool. So it's kind of like uh, monkey patching or or mix-ins in some other languages. Perl can do this. Ruby is notorious for doing this. It doesn't carry over to other uses of the same type, which I think is just incredible. So this is what it looks like to implement a type. This is the one called display in the core format package or the standard library. So we have our size type, which we saw earlier. And to implement the trait, we have to have a method called FMT, which takes a certain set of arguments and returns a certain thing. The details of that is not super important. This is just an example of what it looks to, like to implement a particular trait. There are some traits that are built in, display being one of them, that cannot be derived automatically. So you can't do derived display. You have to do this. And the display trait is how the curly braces at the bottom know what to put for that variable interpolation. It's going to call for FMT on the thing we pass it. You can also. Uh, do even more powerful things so we can define our own trait. It's called reverse, and it requires any implementers of this to implement the reverse function. And then we're going to implement reverse for all of x. This is like a slicer array that contain a thing. It doesn't matter what type is contained, as long as that type implements the copy trait. So that's what that impl t copy thing means. Uh, and again, this is implemented on a foreign type. Vec is part of the standard library, but I'm allowed to do this. It, we won't get this reverse method on every use of vec, just if we import mine. Now, of course, there already is a reverse built into the standard library. This is useless, but it made for a simple example. So if I import the reverse trait, now all my vecs in the scope where reverse was imported will have this reverse method if the vec contains a thing that implements copy. Things that implement copy are many of the built-in types, like all the numbers. Things like string do not implement copy because you don't want to accidentally copy a 10 megabyte string. So does that mean that the compiler says, well, if you don't have this copy, if you don't have reverse, if you don't have the copy implemented, you can't compile the code if you try and apply it to that type? So, so the question was, what? I'll just summarize your question is, what does the compiler do when you have a vec that contains a type that isn't copy? Uh, it just doesn't add the the trait to that vec type. And if you were to try to call reverse on a vec that contained, say, strings, it'll just give you an error that that method doesn't exist. I don't remember if it might, it might even be smart enough to say, hey, you could have this if string Im implemented copy. I'm guessing it doesn't. But yeah, it's it's not a big deal. You can, you can mix, you could have a vec in your code that if, if you import reverse, this reverse trait. You can have a vec in your code that doesn't contain copy types and it just works the way it always works. So this is 
this is just an example of it working. You can look at the, the code examples in the repository to see more details of this. So I mentioned generics, which is you know, very powerful aspect of Rust. So here we're making a hash map. The hash map works with any type for values and for the keys, the key values must implement the EQ equal and hash traits, which I think makes sense. And in this example, we're gonna drive equal and hash for this struct we made. And now we can use that as a key in a hash map. The reason it derives partial equal is to derive equal, you have to also derive partial equal for reasons I won't get into. Uh, so you can have a hash map of really any types of key, any type of value, this is really nice. If you've ever tried to deal with this in Perl, you just come up with some hacky way or you have to use like a CPAN library that somehow stringifies the, the, the non-string data type you want to use as a key and it's, it's a little gross. Here it just works. We can also make our own generic types. So here's a, a type called collection and it has a type parameter of T. Internally, it contains items. It has a field called items, which is a vec of T. This is a totally pointless struct, by the way. This is already built into the language, but it's a very simple example. And one thing you'll see here is we, do, we don't actually specify the type of the COLL value, of the call value, call value. Rust just figures it out. It says, oh, okay, eventually you push an integer into it. So T in this particular case is this integer type. I forget what it picks for, for integers. It's probably a signed 64-bit integer or probably your platform's default integer, so 6432, and this just works. Default is a, a trait that you can derive automatically. It provides this default method. If everything in the struct also implements default, then it just kind of cascades through. So the compiler just infers the type. Very, very nice. We can also add bounds on our generic, so very similar to what we saw with the trait. We can say we have a struct, it it's collection, it has a generic type T, but anything you want to use with this collection type must implement the copy trait. And if it doesn't, it won't work. And the error is going to look like this in this particular code. The reason being we're trying to push a string into this collection and the string is a type that does not implement copy, as I mentioned. So the compiler says the trait copy is not implemented for a string, and it shows us where we uh, said that you must implement copy. So very handy. So I mentioned before about no nil values and how this is related to generics. And the reason is because instead of nils, Rust has two types called option and result. And option just says it's either something or nothing. It's an enum. And that something can be anything, any data type, and nothing is, well, nothing. So in this case, we have a, a function called next value that returns an option of an unsigned 64-bit integer. And what it says is the next value, okay, if I've got 42, I'm just gonna return none. There's no next value, there's nothing better. Otherwise, if it's greater than, I'm gonna return some value in this case value minus one, otherwise I'm going to return some value plus one. But in our code that calls this, we just try to check if next equals 42. Now the compiler is going to say, no, that you can't do that. I expect an enum and I found an integer and it has one suggestion of how you could check this, which I think works just fine. There's other ways to do this. So for example, we can use our pattern matching. So we're going to match and either we got something, in this case an integer, or we got nothing, and we have to handle both cases. We have to explicitly check for none. We can't just treat the return value as an integer, because it's not an integer. It's an option that can, could contain an integer. And then we have something very similar for uh, fallible operations, things that may return errors. We're trying to open a file, and then we're just gonna write to the file, what do you think might happen here? Will this work? Does this code compile? I'm kind of broadly hinting that it won't, I guess. Um, in fact, it will not. And the Rust compiler says, method write not found in result, blah, blah, blah. Again, file in this case does not contain a file struct. It contains a result, which might contain a file or it might contain an error. So we're gonna have to do something else. In this case, when we call dot open, 
I put a question mark at the end. Now file contains a file struct, not a result. What does the question mark do? We also see it on write. Uh, so any fallible option operation can, that returns a result, and we have to check that it's okay. A result is either okay and contains a value, or it's error and it contains an error. The question marks are just shorthand for that check. Basically it says, if it's okay, keep going. If it's an error, just return the error. <clears throat> and our write file function here also returns an, a result because that's what the question mark is doing. And also I'll note at the end, we return okay. The empty parens are just like the, an empty value. So this is kind of the longhand version of what the question mark's doing. We're saying, okay, call open and then match the result. If it's okay, we're gonna extract the contained file. If it's an error, we're gonna return it. And then we're gonna call write and we're just gonna do the same thing again. This time, it's actually just returning from our write file function. So, any questions on, on that stuff so far? Okay, so there's other types of pattern matching we can do. Uh, one example here is you can do if let and then an enum variant equals. So in this case, we have something that returns an option and we're just saying, okay, if we got something, we're gonna print it. Otherwise, if we got nothing, we just ignore it. Uh, you can do this with any type of enum, not just options and results, even enums you create. There's other things you can do with pattern matching. So you can destructure structs. So in this case, we have a point that has X and Y. And then in our pattern matching, we actually assign the X and Y fields to the X and Y variables that are created in this match, and then we can print them out. And again, if we got nothing, then we, we check that as well. And you can see that we're doing kind of nested things. So we have pattern matching on the option, and then we destructure inside that, and you can do kind of arbitrarily complex stuff with this. There's a lot of other things you can do here. Matches can have these conditional guards. So again, we see the destructure, and now we're saying for the first variant, if X is greater than zero, it matches. Otherwise, if it's sum, it matches. Otherwise, none. Now, I wouldn't know, I'm pretty sure it's possible to create like non-exhaustive matches. In this case, the compiler's not magically smart. It can't, it, this would be like solving the halting problem to figure out if you've done this. So you can shoot yourself in the foot. You can also create scenarios where you have multiple conditions where only the first will ever match and the second, you know, the subsequent ones will ever be reached because your, your, maybe your guard clause is always true. So you can definitely write some grotesquely complicated things here. <clears throat> Any questions on pattern matching, generics? Maybe a general question, because you said you can create a match that will never match. So what happens then? Well, that's a great question. What happens if you have a match that never matches? Yeah. I'm Is there like an exception that you have to run, or? No, depending on what the match is doing, so match, all expressions in Rust return values, and so you can assign the result of a match to a variable, in which case that variable will contain none, I wanna say. Uh, otherwise, if you return, yeah. That's a good question, I, have, I haven't tried that out. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'd end up with either a type error, because you try to use the variable later as a non-option, or if, if you were treating it as an option, then you'll get none, but this would be an interesting question. Uh, so I'll mention, talk about iterators. There's a lot of built-in list comprehension methods. We see some here. So we take, create an iterator out of a vec. We can filter, which is a lot like grep in Perl. And we can map, which is exactly like map in Perl. And then we collect to turn the iterator back into a vec of a new type or in this case, yeah, in this case, it'll actually be a new type. And if we print this out, we'll get a whole bunch of stuff. We'll get all the lowercase strings, lo all lowercase strings where they start with D, filtering out Lisa and Laurit. There's a whole bunch of built-in list comprehension methods. This is, there's like, I don't know, 80 or something. It's kind of ridiculous. This is a, a small sampling. You can also implement your own iterators. Again, iterator is just a trait, so you implement it 
on anything, in this case sequence, and we're just gonna keep returning numbers until we cannot, until we decide not to really. <laughs> this is just an arbitrary example. I mentioned before that Rust has macros. There's various types, declarative and procedural, and then different types of things that macros can do. Declarative versus procedural, and actually I probably should reformulate this list, it implies that procedural macros, anyway, uh, de declarative versus procedural is how they're implemented. It's not just about how they're used. Uh, declarative macros use a syntax kind of like pattern matching, so it's maybe a little easier to work with, but it's also more limited. Procedural ma macros get like a raw token stream from the compiler and emit a new stream of tokens, and so you're kind of essentially replacing code in the AST of the program. We've seen a whole bunch of macros, all the things that ended with exclamation marks like back and print liner macros. We've also seen the derive macros. And there, there's also other forms that, like the last one, which is kind of a function-like macro, I, I guess similar to print line and so on. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with this. Like I said, I'm not gonna get into how to write this. This is one of the most painful parts of Rust, I would say, is trying to write these macros. I've written a few myself, uh, very powerful. You can, in fact, that SQL macro is totally a thing you could do because it just takes arbitrary tokens and then you just emit arbitrary tokens. So you could embed other languages in Rust using this. Whether that's a good idea is a different question, but you can. Any language questions so far? Oh, Bruce is telling me I'm at Q&A. I am happy to stop and just go to Q&A. I have a few more slides, but any questions? Yes? I, I get the impression that to go and Rust are aim, aiming at the same niche, which is essentially to be a safe version of C, that the, what Go has for it is Ken Thompson, what Go has against it, is the fact that it belongs to Google, whereas Rust has the fact that it's open source belonging, or it is open source. Is that a reasonable summary, and is, have I missed anything? Okay, so the question was, Go and Rust are aiming at the same target, and the, the fundamental difference is that Go has Ken Thompson, but that it's owned by Google, and Rust is more open source. I don't think no, <laughs> I don't think that's the case. Uh, what I would say is they, are, they have some significant overlap in targets, but because Go has garbage collection, there's a whole bunch of things that you might wanna do with Rust that you really shouldn't do with Go, like embedded programming or real-time programming or just a lot of things that are extremely performance sensitive. Go is a, a pretty performant language, but there are cases where you, it just wouldn't work well. Uh, the other thing I'd say is they're, they're the big difference between them besides that is the philosophy of the language. Um, I feel like this, I could give just like a 30 minute answer on the differences between them, but they're, they're just very different languages. And whether, I, I, I think you know, the mention of Ken Thompson is spot on, where, which is Go is kind of like, C has these issues, I'll get rid of those, but it doesn't, I feel like it's missing out on many decades of language research that happened since C. Um, yeah, uh, Tyler, did you? So I was just gonna add, like, it seems to me that like, Go is more like module-based, right? Like it has a huge thing at once, whereas Rust is more unit-based. So it was, you're saying that Go is more module-based and compiles large things at once and Go is more unit No, I don't think that's correct either. Like, they both have whatever you want to call it, modules, crates, libraries, you can split your code up across compilation units pretty much the same way in both language. I mean, the, the mechanics of it are extremely different. Uh, I will say, however, one huge downside of Rust is the compiler is really slow compared to Go. Go's compiler is just amazingly fast. Unsurprisingly, all that cool type system stuff I showed you and the ownership system and various other things extracts a, it, it cause, it leads to a pretty big slowdown in the compiler. There's a lot of work people have done and are still doing to make it faster. There are things you can do in terms of how you structure your projects by splitting it up into multiple crates. 
that can improve compilation times or make them worse. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't say like the, the, the compilation unit has any significant difference other than, again, the mechanical details. Any other questions? Yeah, Daniel. Are there any lessons from programming Go, I mean, programming Rust that you think apply to uh, Perl or Raku? That's a great question. Are there any lessons that apply from, that, that I think based on my Rust experience apply to Perl or Raku? The, the type system in Rust is pretty great and the, well, it can be annoying in the ownership system, which is really, you know, also part of the type system. And, and you can have the experience Walt describes of just, I got an error, okay, I fixed it, now I have a new error. Oh, now I fixed it, now I have a new error. Can be really annoying. The, what many people cite that they really like about Rust, and I would agree, is that once your code compiles, it's more likely to be correct. This is what people say about Haskell as well, and, and Rust borrows a lot of its type system ideas from not Haskell, but from OCaml, so from functional programming. The, the whole result and option thing is very much a functional programming idea. I feel like I'm more confident when my Rust code compiles that it's likely to be correct. That said, I think people overstate this because the ability to, to introduce logical errors into your code greatly goes beyond the type system. The type system helps you find a lot of errors. The ownership system helps you find a lot of errors, particularly when you're trying to write concurrent code, it is really helpful. But like, if your code doesn't do the thing that the product manager said it should do, that's probably not gonna be caught by the type system. Like you're using the wrong, you're displaying the wrong data or your SQL query is incorrect or uh, you don't validate passwords using the right rules. Like none of this, a lot of this can't really be caught by the type system. Uh, are there other lessons? I will, you know, the other lesson actually was kind of the remainder of the slides are talking about tooling. The tooling around Rust is amazingly good. Rust, the, you start using this thing called, I'm just gonna whip through these slides. You start using this thing called Rust Up, it's a lot like Pro Brew. It installs all the tools you need, Cargo, the Rust compiler, and so on, as well as documentation. It can install multiple tool chains for different architectures, different releases of Rust. And then you use Cargo for all your interactions. You don't actually invoke the Rust-C compiler directly very often. I've never done it except for curiosity. So you use Cargo to start a new project, to build, to test, to run, even to publish, to uh, the crates library, uh, use Cargo to specify your dependencies. All of this is just built into the language. It, has a dependency solver, it downloads everything, it compiles it, it does incremental compilation, it doesn't recompile things, it doesn't need to compile. Uh, I'll skip this because that's not built in. You have Clippy, which is this really nice linter that's built into the language. Uh, it's kind of like Perl Critic, but again, just built in. You can disable or, or enable it for chunks of code or whatever. All of this is just built into the language in a way that, at least for Perl, none of this is. And honestly, the experience in Perl around this kind of sucks and it's not really, I would say it also sucks for Python and other languages just by virtue of not being, have, not having been thought of from the very start of the language. It's very different when this is just, this is how you interact with Rust is through Rust up and Cargo. You can use Perl Brew, you can use, uh, I don't know what the equivalent of Cargo would be, like CPanM and other tools with Perl you can use whatever the equivalents are for Raku, but they're, they're, I think with Raku, some of this is built into the language at least a little more, but not to the degree it is with Rust. And it's just, it's a really, really nice experience using Rust in that way. And I think that's pretty huge. Getting people, making it easy to do these things, manage dependencies, compile things, create binaries, and only having one way to do them that everybody else is doing is, is great. I really think that's a, a good choice. And Go actually made the same choice for some of these things as well, and I think it worked out really well for Go. That's been a great aspect of it. All right, uh, Bruce says, I am done. Like I said, I linked to the slides, there's some more stuff. If you're viewing the slides, if you hit S, you will pull up my speaker notes, which has some more details on this.
And so for my last slide, thank you very much for coming.